Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Elise Adler, Director of Events for Parnassus Books. I am so delighted to share tonight's event with award-winning children's author, Jessica Young, and internationally acclaimed illustrator, Rafael Lopez. Remember, you can buy copies of I'll Meet You in Your Dreams, signed from Parnassus Books. We're gonna go ahead and put the link to do that in the Facebook comments for you. And I wanna mention that not only is this one of the most stunning, beautiful books, but it also got a starred review in Kirkus, which is a very big deal. And tonight we'll be taking audience questions. So be sure and ask them. You can put those in the Facebook comments as well. We are extra excited tonight because Jessica and Raphael are in conversation with reviewer, blogger, author, Julie Danielson. So I am so pleased to turn it over to Jessica, Raphael, and Julie. It's great to be here. Hello. Hello. Hello, Jessica. Hi, Jess. Hi, Jules. It's, it's good so to see great you. to be here. Oh, Thank wow. you for spending this time with us. Um, I do wish we were sitting in a room together, but this is a lovely, lovely alternative and people from all over the US can sign in and be a part of this. So thank you so much. I hope that um, during the past year, this pandemic and all these, all this trying social isolation that you've been well and you and yours are healthy. Um, I, oh, and as I understand, if anybody had anybody out there, we can't see you, but if you have any audience questions, they will get to me. So let me know if any questions pop up and I'll work them in as best I can. So I just thought we would dive right in. Jessica, I wanted to start with you and ask about sort of the birth of this beautiful book. Um, you did a uh, Q and A at Chapter 16, which, if you all don't know, Chapter16.org is a lovely way to spend your time. They did not pay me to say that, but you did a Q and A there where you talked a little bit about this. But for people who haven't seen that, I thought I would ask you what was the genesis of this? Did the title come to you first, or maybe the one of the book's lyrical lines, or the pattern with which you wrote the rhymes? What what came first, and what prompted you to want to tell the story? Yeah, thank you so much. And first of all, I just want to say thank you, Jules, for, for being here. And Raphael, it is just such an honor. This is the first time we've talked together, and it's amazing to be able to do this with you and to pronounce this, who always supports this community of, um, of writers and readers. Um, and we just really appreciate it. And to everyone who's joining. Um, so yeah, the, the idea came to me, it was about 2010. I had to go back and look um, when I was putting my daughter to bed and she was planning what she was going to be in her dreams and telling me about it. And I thought, first of all, how enterprising that she would have the you know, that she would have the sort of like the, the foresight to plan what she was gonna do in her dreams that night, but also um, how fun it would be if, if we could do that together. Um, and so that made me think of the title um, and just that very initial spark of the idea. But like many other <laughs> things that I work on, it kind of came and went and came and went and I couldn't figure it out um, for a long time. And then with help from my critique partners who are amazing and my wonderful agent, um, Kelly, and then ultimately from our editor, Andrea, um, it became the text as it is now. Excellent. Raphael, I would love to hear you discuss your first response to the text as the visual storyteller that you are, did you immediately envision this visual landscape? And I would think that as an illustrator, it would be thrilling to be given this kind of very conceptual metaphorical text that leaves a lot of room for you to, a lot of freedom to invent. So what was your first response? Yes, uh, again, thank you again, Jules, for this opportunity. And I'm so thrilled to finally get to meet Jessica in person virtually, I guess, uh, because uh, yes, uh, the minute I, I the, the manuscript arrived into my studio and I opened it up, I knew I was sold on it. It, it was just the poetry and just like you described it, Jules, it just left a lot of room for interpretation. And I have a background of being a conceptual illustrator so I like to think of it as a circle that we close together. The author begins that circle. I continue that circle with my visual interpretation, but then the reader closes that circle at the end in any which way he or she sees and perceives the story. 
And I think that's more interesting when you have that story that everybody can interpret differently. Uh, so yes, Jessica's writing was perfect, the perfect fit for, for this opportunity. Um, one of the things I want to ask both of you about is, um, I guess we'll start with you, Jessica. It, there are countless picture books in which uh, it's usually a parent or grandparent is expressing their devotion to their child. But in this book, it spans many years. Um, but also in this book, um, it acknowledges the that the child is going to grow and seek autonomy. The the Kirkus review that was just mentioned wrote it this way. Kudos to whoever wrote this. You are honoring the process of children's self determination over time. So it's celebrating the parent child bond. You can hit a rock and throw books like that, but it's it's more. It's also acknowledging that they're going to want to grow and spread. Children are going to grow and spread their wings. And Raphael, you have included in here so many images of creatures in flight from bumblebees to birds to uh, even humans with wings and a beautiful vertical spread. So Jess, can you talk about wanting to acknowledge that autonomy, wanting to convey that and why? And then Raphael, maybe anything you wanna add about conveying that in the illustrations? Yeah, so first of all, I, I did not think about that, honestly. At first of all, it was just a combination of lots of different images. Um, and I was thinking, well, what would be fun to do? Like, if I could plan with her, what we would do? It could, we could do this, we could do this. And it was very disjointed. Um, and something was definitely missing. And uh, and so as I thought about it over years, I mean, I kept coming back to revisit, uh, revisit it and I couldn't quite <laughs> figure out what it was or what needed to happen. Um, and then finally, it just came to me that it needed to be developmental and that it could start with small kind of intimate images and then get more expansive um, and, and bigger and bigger and bigger and freer um, and more independent as it went. But that took like a really long time for me to kind of figure that out. Um, and, and I think part of it was that it automatically, it was already doing that um, in terms of the images. I just wasn't I just wasn't making that connection. And so for me, like, it's also, it's a reminder to me to let go because I need it. And I think it's really difficult. I mean, you want to, you always want to be there to protect your children and, but it's necessary and it's healthy that they develop and that they then become themselves. Um, and I remember as I was writing it, I had this memory of when my first child was a baby and he was a newborn and he was in his cradle and I was sitting there looking at him sleeping and I remember feeling all of a sudden this realization that he was a separate person than me and then I could kind of like predict I, I was seeing his future in that I could see him leaving and I just felt this sense of grief which he's right there and he was a baby but I could I don't know I can't I can't really explain it but um at the same time it was a sense of wonder and just awe that like wow this is he's going to go do this and he's going to go off on his own one day and that already he actually was doing it because he was sleeping and so his consciousness was not with me and uh so anyway but yes thank you for I'm, I'm so glad that uh that people notice that and I think it is a really important piece of it that I did not think of right away <laughs> And I you think know, for children to, to see that too is, I think it would be very interesting to them to think about, oh yeah, when I'm older, they'll still be there. Yeah. Go ahead, Raphael. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, first of all, I, I wish that uh, Jess was around in the studio to tell me this beautiful thing she was doing because <laughs> she could have saved me a lot of sleepless night. <laughs> Trying to figure out what to do, right? Uh, the thing was when I, you see it, there's so many possibilities. How do you express this? Obviously, this is a message of love and love is eternal. Love is um, universal, but how do you express it? And, and what, what is it about love? Part of love is to create a new person or love someone. That doesn't have to be created from your own body, but give that love to someone so they can make pass that love to someone else. So in, in that matter, you are creating that independence on that person to, to project that love to the, the next generation and the next generation, whether you are related, blood related or not, right? So yeah, but this took a lot of sleepless nights of trying to figure out how to bring more universality visually to this story versus talking about a specific group of people or a specific individual or two or three individuals. Uh, so yeah, it's that's the process that is um, terrifying and also very exciting at the same time. This is probably my favorite part of the, the whole thing to try to figure out the schematic of everything and then you start to really sketch it out. 
you just mentioned, <clears throat> uh, you said the phrase, whether they're blood related or not. And another thing I really love about this is that the, the bond that you convey in the book between these, it's two sets really of, of mm -hmm. adult and, and care, caretaker mm -hmm. and child, two sets of them. Um, it's, it could be between, um, it could be any kind of caregiver. In other words, you didn't just paint a typical nuclear family with two parents and a child or something. And the review mentioned earlier says it's a beautiful representation of single parents too. So it can also be that. Was that intentional on your part as the illustrator? Yes, uh, we discussed this a lot. I, I presented a lot of different scenarios. Um, uh, so what, what happens is, and I'm trying to put this in, in, in the right words, but it's exactly that, that love is universal, that love is passed on no matter who you, whether it's a caretaker or not a caretaker. I wanted also to make it a little more, uh, bring it up to date. I mean, I didn't want it to be representing the traditional love of parents to a child, but it could be just anyone you know. It could be an uncle, a caretaker, or anybody that you find a connection to and you care for this person and pass it on. So um, it, 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 was, it was a lot of conversation back and forth. How are we gonna solve this? Because now you have two sets of groups. There's two different groups that could be related or may not be related, but how do you make sense of this story when you're gonna be jumping from one story to the next one and you're gonna be doing this juxtaposition of both of them. And um, so there were a few more sleepless nights and eventually we think we pulled it off and now it's up to the audience to let us know what they think. <laughs> is this something that you all discuss as a team or that what as, as a publishing team this idea that we were just talking about or those are solely your decisions as the illustrator tell them jess oh gosh i, I mean I, I feel like early on in the process i was lucky enough i mean just incredibly fortunate enough to to be able to to brainstorm some ideas and I think you know it would have been very different I think as a book had Raphael maybe like not had these two these two different portrayals you know that you could follow through the whole thing and yet it was so complicated like it's amazing that what you were able to do um, and it also would have been different to have every spread be a different family that wouldn't have had the continuity mm -hmm. you know of going back and forth and follow and having kids be able to follow that child and kind of get what's happening there as they're growing so I think to me like this was the perfect solution which is amazing um, to, to show, to flip back and forth like that. And even in some of them to show the other pair in the background and then they come to the foreground and then, you know, and then they recede and then the other ones come to the foreground. So yes. there was a lot of brainstorming, but it was, I mean, you, you, yeah. you guys are amazing. <laughs> that was great, Jules. And I think that also the, the fact that actually, um, you know, Jessica and I don't talk to each other it's something that a lot of people don't know until the very, very end of the book. And the reason is they don't want us to influence each other. They don't want Jessica on the phone going like, hey, Raphael, it's middle of the night, but I want to tell you something, you know? It's, it's like they want to keep her vision pure and my vision pure and see, and they're the ones that are going to try to interweave the whole thing and make it do the connection. The yeah. trick, Jessica just did it very well. You bring the parents from the background to the foreground and the other ones recede in the background. So the kids can see that connection visually. There's also some elements that move from one page to the next so they can make the connection in their heads that they're talking about this person, even though you're going from reality to fantasy, back to reality, back to fantasy. We were doing that jump back and forth. There's a lot I, going on. It was amazing. A lot, that was a all, lot. To be clear, that was all Raphael. He going back and forth and back and forth and that solution was just brilliant. Uh, so I didn't even I have ask a lot of kudos to the team, the team behind the, the, the group, the whole editors and the art directors too. They, they were great too. So. I didn't ask you, Jessica, what was your two-part question? What was your response when you found out that uh, award-winning illustrator Rafael Lopez was going to do this? And then secondly, secondly, what was your response to seeing that artwork for the first time or, or sketches or whatever you saw first? I, I mean, I was in disbelief. Like I, I, you know, Rafael's colors, the textures, the compositions, the contrast, you know, all of his work I, 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 you know, I've loved for a long, long time. And I felt like he would be absolutely perfect. So when I found out that he would do it, I just, I mean, I was in disbelief really for a long time. And then, um, and then when I actually saw it, I mean, it really, it's super emotional. Like it really, the way his images are, you know, they're, they're so bold and they're colorful 
and they have the textures and there's a lot going on and but there's a, an emotion beneath you know that runs like a current through it and I can't even I still can't get through it without getting teary um you know especially some of them yeah. some of them are are harder for me so I was just floored it was like he took you, you know Raphael was talking about the circle I love that like that I and it was like I could only get part of the way there I didn't have any more like that I was that's all I had and so to have him then you know take these uh, the ideas and the words and then come complete it it was like I only had a few pieces for a puzzle and he had the rest of them and then he held it up and showed me what it looked like. that's that is an excellent description of what a good picture book does you're my best new friend Jessica thank you I need <laughs> <laughs> that is so humbling thank you do because you, the words were beautiful do you have a favorite spread Jessica or is it too hard to narrow it is too hard, but I will, but I did think about this, you know, what, and I feel like tonight, this one, it changes every time, but the oh, wow. one uh -huh. where they're flying, and I love that it's vertical, and it's also, I think, ingenious how, this is every certain number of pages, how many, is it every? We have three, we have three, three spread, uh, so vertical, yeah. Space throughout, and then, so you turn the book, and it just creates this whole amazing column of space and movement. And so anyway, it makes me want to fly. So that's- Well, you know, when you when you soar, you don't soar sideways, you kind of soar up this way, right? So it, it, it had to be a vertical. And I heard that kids, through the my experience with doing verticals, kids love to see verticals. And it's a perfect teaching moment where you're doing something very interactive with them to move the book around and do things. So it's been a, a winning combination to once in a while surprise them with something different. So and there's I'm always happy. a reason for these verticals in here. Sometimes you see them in a picture book where it's like, mm, I don't know if it needed to be that way, but this is right. just right. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Jules. Do you have a favorite spread, Raphael? Yes, I do. You know, as a matter of fact, I do. I think it's right behind me. And it's the one where the father says, let me see if I can just read it before. And I don't have to tear up here, but this is, <laughs> you'll be you and I'll be me. You'll travel places I can't see. So because of my background as a, as a conceptual illustrator, I thought there's so many ways to represent this visual, but it's about the fact that he is in the twilight of his career in the, at the end of his life and she's in the beginning. That's why he's in the moon. She's on a new day. And th but there's this bond between them. There's this little touch or connection that the heart goes out no matter how far you gotta go. Uh, you, you're still connected, even though his eyes are closed, he can't see. There's so many things that you can represent in this visual. And, um, and it, this is one that really took a lot of thinking, a lot of processing, thinking, is this a little too heavy? Is this too much? And I think, you know, kids are so sophisticated. I mean, they can get this. This is going to be really perfect for them because they can interpret it in so many ways. Uh, so I like that because it was a challenge. But it's also because I thought it was very poetic and it would fit perfectly to the words of uh, Jessica. Um, I want to ask you about your the, your medium. Um, we we did an interview many years ago when I asked about your usual medium, and you said because I I love this. I use Mexican acrylic colors that come in big recycled salsa jars and paint on pieces of wood that I cut and sand till the texture and grain speaks to me. So did you paint on wood for this and? What is it that you love about working with acrylics, which I think you often do? This is also watercolors, gouache. It's a lot of questions there, sorry. But just no. talk about how you made this. Well, you know, I think that I, I don't really ever want to be defined by a certain style, although you do have a certain style, right? But I want to be, I want to concentrate on the story. And I think this story needed a lot of lighter colors, even though they were very brilliant. So I decided to go more with watercolors on this. And I spent about a month and a half exclusively creating uh, textures on the studio. I bought a bunch of watercolor paper and I used rollers and big brushes. And then I, I created hundreds of uh, different textures, you know, scraping on things, scan them all, digitalize them. And then because of time constraints, now I put everything together digitally, but it, everything is handmade. So people say it looks hand painted. I go, well, it, it is hand painted. It's just that I don't put it on a surface anymore. The surface is my computer that allows me a little more freedom to you know, move things around, change scales, flip things around. And if there are any corrections, it's just a click away. And boy, I'm giving a lot of secrets away. You know, maybe I should tell people that I still take hours and hours doing this. <laughs> but yes, it is still handmade, Jules. Yeah. It's just that it's put together differently. Right. Yeah. Mm. Um, Jessica, you uh, you also address in 
in your chapter 16 Q and A, you said that um, one of the, this book is written in rhyme. And you said that one of the challenges of writing in rhyme is to weave rhythm into the text so that it supports the story rather than getting in the way of it. So can you talk a little bit more about that? And maybe also for anybody out there listening who's an inspiring picture book author wanting to write in rhyme, which can be very difficult to do well, but you did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh my goodness. Yeah, again, I have puzzles on the brain, but I, do, I feel like that's what it feels like to me is, is a puzzle, is doing a puzzle. And um, usually I will work something up. If I'm working on it in rhyme, I will usually try it without the rhyme too, to just see, you know, if it really warrants having it. Um, and this one has kind of a looser rhythm. It's not as tight of a rhythm, the line length is varying a little bit um, throughout it. And uh, so it is a little bit looser than some of the other ones that I've done. Um, but I also, you know, I feel like that flowing meter um, was, it kind of suited it, you know, and, and also it actually started out with not very much rhyme. It started out and then it, one of my critique partners had, you know, encouraged me at least one to add more. And so I kind of like, added more and more into it. Um, so sometimes I just experiment, but I think, I think it's the rhythm and the sound of the words and the mood that you can make uh, by arranging them like that. But really just in terms of me like playing around, I think for me, it is like a puzzle and it provides a structure that mm. uh, it's just something to start with in a way. Like once I start it and then it gives me something to, to work within in a way. Right. Um, yeah, so I think um, maybe just, I, yeah, I guess that's it, trying things two different ways and making sure that it's, that you feel like it warrants it and that it's stronger with it. Right, yeah. It's kind of what I am trying to do. I noticed too about the puzzles, a lot of people, it seems like are posting that during the pandemic, they are um, doing a lot of puzzles. And I have been writing in rhyme way more than like I've been writing in oh, rhyme a lot. And I'm kind of wondering if I'm seeking that structure in a way, like it's like somehow wanting to, I don't know, provide a structure for myself more than usual. That makes a great deal of sense. Maybe. Um, I, I'm going to go back. Raphael, and ask you about your use of scale in this book. You had a lot of fun with scale, including the spread you just mentioned. Oh, and yes. then also the one that gives me the good, good kind of chills, um, where the we see. Oh yes, mm -hmm. the mother as large as a lighthouse. Um, <laughs> did you find that playing with scale was an effective way to communicate a lot of this evocative conceptual imagery that was in the text? Yes, I think that, we you know, I, I retreat back to the masters of surrealism in a way. And, you know, I find inspiration in so many people, all masters too. And I, part of my background as a, a, a conceptual illustrator too. And I thought, so this is what I do. Um, I, I want to have fun with a story, right? I mean, I don't, you don't want this to be CSA where you are just illustrating exactly what the writer is saying. I wish I had that your ability, by the way, Jess. It's amazing, you know, but I, I, I can only paint. So it's beautiful. But what I do, I when I, we have that first meeting with the editors and the art directors, I tell them, let me shoot really high and do something pretty crazy and really like surreal. And you rein me in. If it, you think it's a little too out there, bring me in. Because if I start too secure at the bottom, I'm stuck in there. I'm stuck in the muck. And I can't get out of that. I can't come back there and says, oh, by the way, I have a much better story. So I think it's better that they think that you're a little bit off kilter and they go, all right, you know, that's kind of good, but let me bring you back just a little bit here. And that's what I did with this story. I thought kids are so sophisticated and they're not afraid to see a big face or a giant mother because she represents this giant love or mother caretaker or female caretaker. And, uh, and I thought, why not? I mean, kids love fantasy. I love to see this giant person, this beautiful, big love caring for you. And, uh, you know, we thought about this one for a while. I think, do you think this might be a little scary for some kids? And I, I, we decided that it was not, that it was going to be something that they will see as this big love. It's the, this person that makes you feel protected. And then, you know, we gave it a shot and uh, hopefully kids don't lose any night's sleep or something. But yes, scale is used for that specific purpose of creating that emotion, evoking a, an emotion of big love, eternal love from whoever is caring for you. And a, a good way to do it in an effective way is using scale. Um, you 
you just mentioned um, one way, sort of part of your process as an illustrator when working with a publisher. And in an interview with we did forever ago, you said your approach to color is very instinctual. You said, I have a general idea where the painting will end up, but I never give the art director a color sketch because I feel oh, it might restrict goodness. me six months later when I come up with an even better color solution. Is that how you work with this book or? I still do that. I still don't, you know, if someone says, can we see like a, a, a color sketch? I'm, usually I, I'm pretty straightforward with the art directors and the editors, as I said. Um, I'll give you an idea and a general idea, but as I evolve this painting, things might get better. So I prefer to give you an improved version of what I gave you rather than being stuck to that original idea that now I consider just, um, you know, mediocre. So yes, and in the case of the story with Jessica, it also felt like there was a passage of time because love is eternal. So love goes from before you were even created or you before they someone met you. There's always that connection eventually that moves on and lives forever. So I thought it's also like a passage of time. And in many of Jessica's um, descriptions, there's that the twinkling in the night, you think, well, this is going to be a night scene. So I thought that it would be a good idea to start with some kind of a daylight sunrise and it goes through the day and then it goes into the dark and then goes up again into the daylight. So that also dictates the color in this case. And once you have that big background color uh, selected, everything else is a lot easier. It's always the, the hard part is to pick that big background color is the most intimidating thing. And after that, you start just putting things that match that color. Have, have you ever thought about writing your own book? Oh, yes. Oh, and yes. Do you, do you know that Jessica, <laughs> Jessica, you studied art, right? And teach art. So you ever wanted to illustrate? Have you ever wanted to write? And have you ever wanted to illustrate your own book? <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Um, you know, I used to, I used to want to, but now, like, I mean, when you can have a book <laughs> that looks like this and to have somebody complete that process like that, it, it actually, you know, I can't imagine it. I can't imagine it because I'm so uh, used to, and I love so much this being a team uh -huh. sport, like, and I can't, I feel like I would, feel lonely I mean to be you know and it, we would have I would have you know the publisher and stuff too but I just I feel like and it's that element of surprise like I feel like it's getting like you're getting the best gift ever and it's a surprise gift when you first look and see the images and um so yeah I mean maybe the right book maybe one day in the future but I just it's hard to even think about it when I mean you know when I can have a process like this and and have my ideas look come out like this like what <laughs> I could never have imagined ever that so and I would lose that have you ever wanted to write or write and or illustrate your own story uh, I think well? I think the time has come to Jules and I think that it, it it's also this natural thing that you have I have a great story in mind I can't reveal it yet because it's just like in it's in brewing and, but the hardest part is to write it, to put it together in words. I mean, I'm more of a visual person and I'm just gonna need a lot of inspiration and help and understanding and sleepless nights again, because I think that the simpler uh, stories are the hardest to tell, right? In so few words. And I can tell I, I might get carried away and someone's gonna say, you can say that so much more beautifully, just like Jessica, come on, look, take a look at this, come on. So yes, it, it's gonna happen. Um, I love what you said too, Jess, about the collaboration. I love collaborating too. I think that you, if you want to be in the book world, you love to collaborate. I love when people give me suggestions. I like when people say, what if you do this? Uh, I never feel like this is like, this is going to be this way. I mean, I like to say, hey, what do you think of this? I, I always refer to the team as team, you know, good morning team, how's everything going? I love the collaboration. And I think that's what I enjoy the most about this creative process. Um, there is a question from the Facebook audience. Dan is asking, Jessica, have you been able to show your daughter the final product? And what, if so, was, what was her reaction? Yeah, yeah. I actually sat down and read it with both of my kids. And, uh, you know, they're, they're just had a lovely response. I mean, they had to pour over the illustrations because they are so beautiful. And it takes a while. I mean, it just takes a while to take them in. Um, so that's you know, an amazing thing to be able to do, to be able to sit there and, and over this long period of time, I mean, you know, she doesn't even, she doesn't remember the night that I'm talking about. She doesn't remember telling me about her dreams that night, but you know, so it's, that's how long 
it's been, but it's such a gift to be able to do that. So. Um, <clears throat> how have you two stayed inspired this past year with all of the necessary social isolation? What is your day of illustrating and day of writing look like? Go ahead, Jess. Oh, you go ahead. That's okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> I mean, for me, I think that we as artists, we've already gotten used to be isolated in the studio. Uh, you know, you see your friends once a year. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, you 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 find you find your inspiration surrounded by your music, your books. Uh, you know, sadly, you can't go to uh, museums for a while. You couldn't go because that that was always a perfect um, formula for me when I'm feeling stuck is like, go to a museum, look at all those people that are going to blow you away and then you're going to come back and you're just ready to go. But, um, I, I have found comfort in, in, in art, in drawing and in creating the, the pieces. So it's been an escape actually for me, even though I live in a studio and there's four more people in the studio having zoom meetings and things, I can somehow learn to block everything out and just zoom in, in the illustrations that I'm doing. So, Art has been a very healing and, and a way to also create more uh, inspiration by itself. It just continued to, you know, you, you do something, you want to do something else, and that creates a new idea and this and that. So it sort of keeps evolving. So, yeah, sitting there creating, it's a good way to pass the time and make it feel like it's going super fast for me. Yeah. Me too. I mean, and I think it's the same with that, talking about the rhyme and the structure and stuff like that. It gives me something to hold on to. Like it gives me a way to zoom in onto very specific, you know, words and sentences and sounds. And it's a very peaceful, I mean, it can be frustrating for sure too, but it's very peaceful for me. It's a way of putting blinders on mm -hmm. in a way, but also being motivated by all of the people who I see are out there you know, working so hard. I mean, other creators also just, you know, healthcare professionals and, and just everybody, you know, through all of this. And, you yeah. know, we've been very reclusive um, through the whole thing, but um, I've been inspired by knowing that everyone is out there doing the best they can and, and thinking about what, you know, what do I have to contribute and how can I, you know, how can I best do that? And, um, the other thing is reaching out, doing virtual school visits, or, uh, my kids and I have been doing some videos, um, where we read books for kids online, um, things like that. So kind of a combination of like reaching out and doing what we can, but then also just, you know, zooming in and, and putting on the blinders too. So. Mm -hmm. Raphael, you mentioned your studio. Can you tell us about it? I know before the call, you were saying you really wish you were there. Do you have a studio in your residence in Mexico as well? The one in San Diego, it sounds like you share with others. Sure. Uh, no, well, just to be clear, I'm not in my studio. I'm actually in Arizona because I have to drop mom. She's getting a vaccine. So you see me with this non-personal area here. But yes, I have a studio. It's an old warehouse in San Diego. I purchased it about 20 years ago, a little more maybe. And uh I reconditioned it and now half of it is a studio um, and it's, I love it because it's big and it gives me a lot of room to just get around and that's also the living area. And I also, and I have all the collection of things that I love, you know, I love folk art that inspires me all the time. I still con connect to the, to my culture, to Mexico. So I'm still inspired by the textures, the colors and the folk art of Mexico in a huge way. And then I have the studio in my home in San Miguel de Allende as well. Um, and it's in the basement. And uh, sometimes people say, hey, don't you want a view with this magnificent? I go, you know what? I like sometimes to be just closed in. For some reason, I, I find this comfort to be there without any distractions. And, and uh, yeah, so I think that many artists, we are sort of like introverts in some way. And we like to just close in and just create our moment and our space and do something that really is meaningful to other people because you need to find something that is meaningful to other people. You can't just do something for yourself. And that's why we love to work for books. You know, you want to make, you want to leave something that will be inspirational, a book that people will remember and they'll find something positive on it and send some kind of a positive message in this world, you know? And uh, yeah, so I got the two studios. <laughs> you're, you're talking about this non-personal space, but you're filling it up with your very wonderful personality. So you're good. <laughs> There's another question here. As one of Jess's critique partners, I'd love to hear if Raphael has other artists he bounces ideas off of and how his feedback process works. Um, so do you know illustrators what? have a similar 
like critique partners? Um, you know what? Um, because of the isolation right now, I haven't seen many of my friends. Um, and in San Diego, it's such a expand. I mean, if, if when you're in New York, every time I visit my friends in New York, they get to see each other. Perhaps not this last year, but I wish I had a lot more of that. You have to get on a car to go on the freeway. It, there's not that many people that live in San Diego that are illustrators. And um, so I talk to people once in a while. I, I let them know what I'm working on. Sometimes I feel like I shouldn't share much because this is still a you know, thing that hasn't been published yet. But I do share with different friends. They don't necessarily have to be, um, I, I, as a matter of fact, uh, students. I love the, the young minds that are out there too. And they may hear something and they say, do you ever thought of this? Um, two of my, my a nephew and a cousins are artists as well. So I tell them what I'm working on. And, and it's just fun to hear what they have to say, my opinion. Sometimes I, I don't want to feel stuck in a certain generation. I, I'm, as an artist, you, you want to accept all kinds of ideas from different people. In San Miguel, I have a lot more social life. And so you share things with your friends, musicians, and anybody that is a creative mind can give you some kind of advice and you can connect it all together because all art interrelates and interconnects in some way. Are you are you both mentioned school visits, and I know you're both really passionate about that. Are, do you have plans for virtual school visits for this, like separately or together? And how has that been working in the past year for you all? Go ahead, Jess. That would be a lovely thing to do. Do it together, Jess. But I don't know. Uh, that would be awesome. That would be amazing because I I would love to see. I actually have with some of my illustrator friends done like just some presentations to kids before. And my favorite part is when you draw with them. Like I just think it's amazing. You know, they brainstorm ideas and then you guys draw with them. Um, that would be incredible. But and I also think they love seeing the sketches. You know, mm -hmm. they love seeing the process and and how things evolve. But um, yeah, I've, I've been doing some, I actually have one on Friday and I have some coming up. Um, so I'm really looking forward to sharing the book with them um, as well. And I think virtually it's actually gone smoother than what I thought it would. And I feel closer to them than what I, than what I thought I would like. And I feel like maybe it's because you actually get to be, feel like you're physically close to them. Whereas sometimes in person, depending on the group, you you know, they're kind of far away <laughs> sometimes. So I think there are good things about it. And I'm just grateful that we can, that we can still connect with them. Yes. Another question. I am grateful. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful too. Although um, because of what I do, like, like Jessica was saying, I do more of the, uh, the drawing, the sketching. And sometimes I bring out my little ukulele and we sing and play and, you know, be, we just get silly. I miss that part a little bit because it's very interactive. My presentations, you know, I invite them to draw with me and sometimes I joke around. I, I pretend that I don't understand what they were saying and I draw something silly and you get that laugh, the reaction and I, just their faces to see their smile on their face. I miss that part and I hope that we get it soon, but we all need to be safe, of course. But um, yeah, it's been going very smooth and uh, I'm, I mean, you know, I'm sure that you were very active too, Jess. I'm trying to do maybe at least two a month. And some people do maybe once every day or so, I don't know. But it's great. It's great to know that they're still there, that there's the contact with the community and the, the students and the kids. And just, I've done some workshops as well, where I've been teaching them how to do this or how to do that, some tricks and things. So the interactive part is a little bit tricky when you're doing it online. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, another question, Tori asks, do more revisions happen with collaborators slash critique partners or with the editors after your work leaves your friend circle? Yeah, that's a tough one. Like, mm -hmm. I will tell you, <laughs> my poor critique partners. I have, um, I have uh, some critique partners who have hung in with me for a long time and I am pretty obsessive and I submit things to them a lot and they are so patient and so wonderful. Um, so for me, like I will say that always there is pretty, pretty much always there is a ton of input and, and that's part of my process um, that is really meaningful. Um, and then later, I mean, my agent too is actually very editorial and she's really, really helpful in that respect. And then um, later, it just depends on the book, honestly. Like some books I feel like are way more than others and it kind of just depends where it was and what vision they have for it when, when we start working together. So sometimes a, a lot, but sometimes not very much at all. So but relatively speaking. Right, right. You know, for me, it was more of a, 
I, this is like a dream come true. One of those, uh, you know, once in a lifetime opportunities, this book, because of the writing, the team behind it. Uh, this is my first time that I've, I've ever been with uh, Little Brown. Um, you know, they have this incredible record of creating amazing books. And uh, Andres Spooner was our editor. And they were amazing. You know, the art director and her were just so collaborative and so open to any kind of idea that I had. They never shot me. I never felt like they were shutting me down or feeling like, oh, my gosh, what am I doing? It was incredible that the way they encouraged me to keep exploring. So everything happened between us. And then I'm sure that they share that maybe with Jessica. Eventually, I have no idea that part because they try to keep us apart. Right. And that's what we're friends. Right, Jessica? <laughs> But yeah, it, it's great when you have that great team that you feel that they're behind you, they're behind your ideas, they really listen to you and they go, you know, let's give it a shot. This is a little bit uh, exploratory and maybe experimental, but let's see what happens. Excellent. Um, are there any other audience questions? I think we have to wrap up in about five or so minutes. So if there are any questions, please do type them at Facebook. Um, and I will get to them. I'm going to wrap up, I guess, with one more, unless more questions come in. Um, I'm stepping back for a very big picture question, which is, you could easily be working in another field, dentistry, you could be executives, you could be deep sea divers, test <laughs> testers, I don't know. Um, why, what is it about writing an illustrated children's books that you love why not dentistry i mean why why do you do this <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> oh my goodness and then um, there's one more at least one more audience question okay do you want to go ahead or you go ahead no you go first i mean i think two things the, the two main things for me i think are are one is selfish for myself because i love uh i just love playing with ideas and words and images or concepts and, you know, and, and working on a team like this and being able to create something like it just is, I would much rather be writing uh, than pretty much anything else, you know? So I, for me, like that's, it brings me joy. I love the process, even though it's sometimes frustrating, of course, but, um, and then the second, and also, cause I get to revisit what it's like, you know, I, I get to think in ways that I think I would not normally, and I get to make that part of my job that I, you know, that I love. And then the other one is just the audience. I mean, thinking about kids, thinking about being able to have an impact and like, especially right now, I mean, just the feeling helpless and not being a doctor and not being someone who can be out there on the front lines doing something. It's like asking yourself, well, what, you know, what can I do? Um, and I think, you know, being able to connect with kids is, is huge and, um, you know, hopefully make them think, make them laugh. And if this book can bring comfort or, or, you know, imagination or a moment of peace or reflection to a family and to kids, that is, I mean, there's, there's nothing better than that. So it's, it's a rush too. For me, it's the, uh, two things too. Uh, first is I don't look good on ties and I don't shave very often. So <laughs> that's, that's not the life for me, I guess. Now, seriously, it's uh, getting up in the morning and know that every day is going to be different. You never have an exact same day. You have to create a, out of nothing. You have these white peas in front of you. So that makes it so exciting. Second thing, I, secondly, I think is just a creativity keeps you young, your mind young. I'm going to be 60 this year and I don't feel 60. You know, I feel like my mind is still exploring. I'm learning new things every day. And I love to have a job that doesn't feel like a job, that it feels like passion. You know, I can't wait to sit down and do this. And thirdly, exactly what Jessica says is you need, it, me, it needs to mean something. You can't just do something for yourself. You need to feel like you have, you're leaving some kind of work effort that is going to leave some kind of mark or a legacy to people, to the community, especially to the young uh, generations behind you. So that all that comes together, except the time, the shaving, that part. <laughs> uh, one more audience question. Ellen asked, do you think you might do another one together? I'm ready with those beautiful writings. I'm ready, Jess. Come on, let's do it. I would be so thrilled and honored. That would be- I'll be very honored too. It would be very nice, yes. Well, it's been so great to talk to you too. I can get in a car when the pandemic's over and drive to visit Jessica, but Raphael, to connect with you through cyberspace. And San Miguel. In person is so great. Oh yeah, maybe one day I'll do that too. 
but it's a thrill to finally talk to yeah, you. It's Jules, great we've to known see. each other for so many years. This is wonderful great. to see your place and your Fiber book. meet you, yes. And then you and Jessica connecting for the first time. It's wonderful. Thank you so and much. Jessica, my new friend too, Jess. It's great to talk to both of you <laughs> and you. have a great Thanks. evening. So you happy, and happy you. book birthday. Yes, happy, happy book birthday. birthday. And thank you to hey. everyone for coming. Thanks for everyone. Parnassus. And everybody, yes. thank you. Thanks, Parnassus. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Parnassus, too. Bye now.